right, everyone, welcome back. Welcome back, Bree. We are in our four, fourth part of the four-part embodiment of the feminine archetype series. How are you feeling on this fourth episode? I'm feeling great. I was just actually going for a walk and just having like all these thoughts come up and stuff. So like I said, it's just been really fun to take each one week to really look and think about each one of these in depth and have have new insights come up and new connections. It's been an honor to journey with you on all of this. <laughs> it's been a hit in my body. Being able to nail it with where I'm at in my own cycle. For everyone out there, I'm on day one of menstruation and we're going to be talking about the winter portion of the archetype. So I'd love for you to bring her to the forefront and whatever on your walk that you were thinking about that really popped up that you want to start speaking on. The wise woman crone archetype is the fourth one in the series. She can also be thought of as the first one because it's a cycle, right? So you could start anywhere along this cycle. She's the last stage of life that we think about, but she could also be seen as the first stage two of who we all come from is this wise woman. And she represents this deep universal wisdom. I think of her a little bit as being associated with ego death. So through the rest of our stages, we're out in the world and we're sort of creating an ego and an avatar that interacts with the world. She is the stage of the cycle where we can let that go. And like we talked about last week, the wise woman enchantress, part of what is so hard about that stage is that that's an ego dying stage and letting go of the ego is very hard because it's what we feel like keeps us safe we've identified with it it's who we think we are and it really isn't and after we go through that wild woman enchantress phase whether that's the the cycle in our life that is associated with that which is the perimenopause phase or the premenstrual phase when we get to menstruation or that menopause phase, we can feel a little bit of relax and release and surrender because we've arrived back at this place of universal wisdom of being our true selves, being morphed back into everything. We've kind of become one with the world again. That shows up a lot for us in our menstrual time because we can see things a little bit more clearly. We can often have what I feel sometimes when I hit menstruation is just this release of energy and everything that was bothering me, my inner critic, everything that was going on during the previous phase has relaxed and I can just settle and feel at home in myself. So I think she has this feeling of really being at home. Mm, That feeling it's cozy and it's quaint. And I like to even speak on how that resonates in my body. The first time that you really do feel it all go. So what are some of the light aspects of the wise woman crone? And then we'll go into the shadow. Some of the light aspects, she can be really nurturing. And like I talked in some of the past episodes, if you haven't gotten to listen to them, definitely do because this all makes more sense when you hear it all together. (laughs) When you look at the two archetypes of the crone wise woman and the mother creator goddess, they have very different energy, but also similar energy. They both have this arrival energy of I've settled into something. And another place I see similarities is that they both feel very nurturing, but in a different way. So whereas the mother is very nurturing in this very direct way, I think of the crone wise woman being more like the grandmother of a child, where Mm -hmm. the love is this more expansive love. I don't mean that in a negative way that mother's love is not expansive, but it's this more wise universal love. Mm -hmm. And I think about this when you think about children, you know, I've seen sometimes where mothers can sometimes have a hard time accepting something about their child. And a grandmother can totally accept that child because this type of love goes very, very deep. And they're a little bit removed, whereas the mother might have their ego tied in a little bit with their own child. The grandmother is a little bit removed and can have that deeper universal love 
Absolutely. I feel okay. that with my nan really hardcore. Yeah. My yeah. nan and I were besties. We still are. She lives in Florida, so we're far apart now. But growing up, there were definitely times where my mom and I, it'd just be two Leos button heads with each yeah. other. And then my nan would just come in with a bologna and butter sandwich and be like, here, everything's better. And uh-huh. not that that was healthy, but I was like, Nan, you're the best. <laughs> yeah, that's so sweet. I think a lot of us can see that where we maybe had a grandmother or a more elderly figure in our lives that could accept us on a deeper level than our direct mother. She also has the gift of vision. We talked about how the wild woman enchantress is that time of the cycle or time of our lives where the veil between the two worlds can be very thin whether that's with ancestors or spirits or between our own conscious and subconscious. And so in the wise woman phase, we're in that deep subconscious world where we can have these visions and be more connected to, to larger concepts, bigger, wider ideas than just our earthly selves. And that's why I think it's really important during menstruation to give yourself space, as much space as you can, because we all have different schedules and different needs in our lives that we need to attend to. So just whatever amount of time that you can give, even if it's only five minutes sitting in the car before you pick up your kid or, you know, you wake up just five minutes earlier and just lie in bed thinking about it or whatever, being in contact with that that higher source power knowing energy whatever you think about it whether it's god or another energy it's just such a special time and i look forward to that time of my cycle now where i can feel like i don't need to try to be insightful i just lay back and let the insights come to me and it's an exciting time because it's like what is out there that i don't know that is just going to come find me right now. I think that's also an energy that we can see in that time of our life. I haven't hit the wise woman crone phase in my own life, but looking archetypally at stories and patterns and things like when you hit that stage, we have this elderly wise woman who's maybe sitting in the chair in the corner and she seems kind of checked out. But then one of the characters in the movie goes to talk to her and she's got this really deep wisdom. That stage has this wisdom about it. And there's also a slowness to the wisdom I was talking to my partner the other day and he'd been on a phone call with someone who was mentoring him when she was in her nineties. And he said, she just talked really slow. I was getting ready for this episode too. And I was just thinking about, yeah, that wisdom, it's a very slow wisdom. And so we need to match that pace. We need to go slow in order to get it because a kid running around in the room, just wanting to play with grandma is not going to get the same level of her wisdom as they are if they sit down and have a conversation with them. I think about that in our menstrual cycles too. If we just blast through it and we just keep doing all the things on our to-do list and going out and being all social, we're going to miss some of that wisdom that comes from being very slow. We need to match our own vibration, our own energy with that slowness in order to receive that. This sounds like a complete calling back to self. And I've been thinking so hard on this as I'm in this phase now. And with this whole series, the four weeks leading up I'm like, all right, how can I really embody this? I'm really diving in. It's this whole, exactly what you just said. When we stop and we just lay, when we stop and we take that extra breath and we contemplate or we take the time to listen, we are shocked and rocked with everything that we've needed. And it's the medicine that we've been looking for versus searching and seeking, which has its time and place. How you said in the first episode, well, you're at a family reunion. And perhaps you're on your cycle and people are like, oh, well, she's not being herself. She's not all, all chatty Kathy today. It's like, well, no, she. you can still talk and commune, but in a more gentle, quiet, intimate way versus yeah. rambunctious and jovial to the nine putting on this mask. Mm-hmm. How could people speak this boundary clearly while not feeling like they have to dance around what other people feel? I think it really comes down to not necessarily saying anything or setting boundaries because being in your own wisdom, I feel like is not something that that necessarily needs boundaries. What I think it needs is faith in your own self. That word faith, that's another word that I associate with the wise woman crone is just faith that, that this is what 
is right right now. If you're in your menstrual phase and you're feeling like you're being called upon too much, I think it's more about being okay with yourself Mm -hmm. to take the time and step back because it all comes from within us. If we're at peace with how we are, then nothing anybody says to us can rock us, right? We feel solid in who we are and her wisdom inherently helps us feel solid in that because she's why she knows that all these happenings that are going on in the world, all the butterflies and the storms and everything, those are all passing things. Anything anybody wants you to do, like those are all passing things. Any Thing anybody wants you to be that's a passing thing coming home to yourself knowing who you are being solid in who you are and also the wisdom of knowing that if I say no to somebody I'm not a bad person that comes from within us we don't need somebody else to be like oh, okay I get it you're on your period that's okay you don't have to help me out it really comes from us if we're looking outside for for validation we get in trouble when we look outside for validation by being everything for everybody. But also if we look outside for that validation of somebody saying, it's okay, you don't have to do this. We're still looking for outside validation. It's about the internal validation of I'm on this part of my cycle and I'm going to take care of myself and I am fine with that. And I'm fine with whatever anybody says to me about it. And it doesn't matter. (laughs) That to me, that's the essence of wise own current energy. (laughs) Mic drop. That's it. Yeah. All right. Thanks for coming to the show. That's all we got. <laughs> yeah. That was that was perfect. Thank you so much. Yeah. I'm taking that home with me today. Yeah. That's the ego death part of it is we're so scared to not be validated by other people, but that's our ego. Ego is the one that wants validation. Our authentic selves don't need validation because we know that we are enough. We know that we're doing the right thing already. If we're allowed to let the ego drop fully, then we get her gifts of that deep wisdom and we have faith. And another word I like with her is detachment. And that a lot of people I think see maybe detachment as a negative connotation but to me detachment is really just sit back and and observe there's nothing in this world that is so urgent that we can't just sit back and observe what's going on i agree and that quote of nature is never rushing yet everything gets done it's yeah. coming back to that simplicity that everything moves at its own pace And I love what you just said about the internal validation. That's been a practice for years of mine now. You just hit another layer of it that I really (laughs) needed to hear. Do you think that there's a time and place for the ego? Yes, definitely. The the virgin warrior phase, that's about building ego. And then the wild woman enchantress is about letting go of ego. We come to earth as these spirits or beings, whatever you want to think of them. And we do need an ego to get around in the world. I don't think they're necessarily all bad, but our egos do tend to hold on to things and they can make a little bit of trouble for us. That's also part of the challenge of this life is to consistently learn to work with that ego. And it's not necessarily that you can ever get rid of your ego. I don't think that's possible really. But as one of my friends says, make your ego work for you or match up who your ego self is with your authentic self as closely as possible. It's not that they won't stray from each other. I feel this for myself in the the premenstrual phase when my inner critic is coming up and I'm being really hard on myself. And so I know that my authentic self would never be that hard on myself because my authentic self is always loving and warm to myself. But the ego self has reared up and taken on this different quality and energy. And it's my job to to allow that ego self to come back closer to the authentic self, which I think is what I was talking about when I said ego death, because I don't know if egos can really die, at least in our human experience. Mm -hmm. I feel like ego death is a thing. I feel like I've been through a couple and I think that just comes with different levels of consciousness that you step into and perception. I mean, what is life but a perception and thoughts that we think and that we cling to and that turns into a belief. Like all a belief is, is a repetition of thoughts and a pattern. (laughs) Right. I think our our egos go through a lot of different iterations and reincarnations. So I guess we Mm -hmm. could have one type of ego die off and then another 
come to life, but I think that we will sort of always have an ego by our sides. And it's just that process of creating the ego that we want to represent ourselves that is very close to our authentic selves. Very well said. It's just continuing to take costumes off and costumes off the ego. Uh Like what's not yours? What's not yours today? All right. Again, tomorrow. How could we better tap into this wise woman crone when it comes to seasons and then in the actual life cycle? Like you said earlier, we're not there personally as old women. We're in the ovulation part of the life cycle. Yeah, actually, that is a perfect leading because I was just thinking of the story that I wanted to bring up. A while back, a couple of years ago, actually, this was before COVID, I was visiting a friend in Eastern Washington and she lives on this property out in the country. Eastern Washington is already pretty rural, but she's very far away from any city centers. I don't think she's completely off grid, but it's very, very rustic accommodations where she lives. She's basically just a sleeping structure. It might be built with cob or something with a wood stove in it. Also in Eastern Washington, it gets very cold in the winters and can be really snowy. And they can be pretty long winters, I think, at least compared to the west side where I grew up, where we don't really get snow. She was saying that she spent the whole winter taking naps and dreaming and journaling and writing. And she said it was really blissful. And I tried to imagine my own self doing that. And I was like, man, I don't know if I could ever let myself do that. That seems so scary. I'm a very active person and I would want to go fill my schedule with things. I want to go do things a lot. And hearing her say that really piqued my interest. What could I learn about myself? What dreams or visions would come up if I let myself take a whole winter season and do that? What I think about is that that fear of me thinking I couldn't do that or that fear of, oh, I'd be missing out or that fear of I would feel lazy or any of those fears mm-hmm. that are coming up. Those are shadow sides to it. The blissful part of it is that is in the book Wild Power, they talk about bliss being one of the, the gifts of menstruation. Mm-hmm. And it is this this feeling of, of detachment and letting go of everything. And I've arrived. And I think we get so scared of doing that because our world really asks us to be in motion all the time. So Mm -hmm. being still is very scary. I also want to point out that any of those excuses that I'm making, like, oh, I'd want to be active or, oh, I couldn't do that. Anytime you start to make excuses, and this goes for any of the archetypes, that's a sign to dive in deeper and to get to know that more. Ever since that winter when she told me that, Mm -hmm. I've been trying every winter to bring a little bit more of that into my life. And I haven't hit a stage where I can literally cut ties with everything and go live in an earth hut and sleep and dream all day. But I've definitely tried to bring that in a lot more into that winter phase of my life. Also to mirror that during my menstruation. I love just going and lying on the floor during my menstruation and being like, what's going to happen? Just let my mind wander. Another thing that I love that I heard from Ellen Gilbert, who I follow on Instagram. We've talked a little bit and she's awesome. She goes into a lot of this stuff too, but she talked about how goal setting and visioning are different. If you think that visioning is the same as goal setting, take some time to look at that because goal setting, I think as the virgin warrior, it's very Mm -hmm. action driven. Whereas visioning is more this really expansive I keep using the word universal, but that's what I just keep thinking about is that the crone is just very tied to that, that universal pool of energy. So visioning is much bigger than goal setting. It's this huge receptive energy that you can bring things in from the universe that you didn't even know were there. And then after that, you can set your goals that might come up based on that. That's a great distinction. And I 100% agree. They are not the same thing. My first experience, I mean, I've always been a visionary dreamer type of person, but it just happened. I wasn't consciously aware of it. I'd do my thing and things would happen. I'd think of something and it happened. And it was just effortless because I didn't know about it. Once I learned about it, I was like, oh, I'm really good at this already. I was visioning every morning for five minutes. I wake up enjoying the bed, enjoying my body. I'm excited about today. This is such a good moment. And I feel like a little bit of this um, menstruation era can 
appear in those first moments of waking and the few moments before falling asleep, because those are those times that we're still in bed and arising or getting into bed and about to go retire for the day. I would get lost in everything I ever imagined. It's limitless. That's what I think about when you're saying universal. I'm like, yes, deep chord in my heart. It is, there are no conditions. That's the beautiful part of menstruation too. This era, as I become a little bit older and I learn more about archetypes and the cycle and how to track it and the moon, like, Mm -hmm. okay, what can I really tap into? And can I detach? Can I let go? Can I allow it to appear without resistance, without doubt, without having to worry or be fickle? And the fact that you said, if it's something you're doubting or making an excuse about, you got to dive into it. Mm-hmm. I say that about exercising. There's specific exercises we love. Mm-hmm. Then there's the ones that make us feel pain. Those mm-hmm. are the ones we probably need to do more. That love-dislike relationship yeah. is there. It's a new way to find ourselves and find a new way to like a part or aspect of our life that maybe we haven't appreciated fully yet. Another thing that I think is great is being able to identify these in your own cycle. I know I've talked about this on all the episodes, but in case this is the only one you listen to, (laughs) moon journaling, tracking your cycle and writing it all out and tracking how you feel day to day can really help you see these archetypes in your life. If you want to learn more about it, Isabel's going to put a link in the episodes to my guide to moon journaling. Mm -hmm. That's the best way to see these and work with them in your own life and get these insights for your own unique energy because some of the things that I say may not be completely true for you and it's important to find out what is true for you personally. Let's dive into winter. I know we all know what winter is. I'd love to hear your viewpoint of winter and how it relates to this. Like I said with my friend who was just dreaming and visioning, I think that is such a cool way to experience winter. But I think for anybody who's not able to do that is being able to identify those moments where you can go deep into yourself. The darkness really helps the lack of light or indoors more. And that's something interesting for me that I noticed around my menstruation is that I love being outside all the time. But when I hit fall, winter in my cycle, I feel like I want to be inside. I want walls around me like a cocoon. It's just that coziness. And I think we kind of naturally get that coziness during winter. And I think for a lot of us in the winter, sometimes we feel that that sad or seasonal affective disorder. And when I think about this in myself, I used to get this actually. And now I feel like the last couple of winters I've, I've started to shift to when I'm feeling that, can I do what we were talking about, sit back and relax and receive energy. And that sad for me, at least comes a little bit from wanting to have energy. I love summer so much. Summer is definitely my home season, (laughs) but I also have started to love winter on a deeper level when I realize the gifts that it has and that that ability to be cozy and to be really introspective, it doesn't come up in the same way in the summer for sure. And to be able to take advantage of it and use it to its full potential, I think is really beautiful. Mm. I just want to bask in it, bask in the (laughs) slowness and the yumminess of it all. When you get there and you take that minute and you're in that stillness and you savor it, it's like a fine wine or a really delectable cheese that's aged for however many years. There's just a certain kind of flavor to that Mm -hmm. part of life. And that's where it's really delicious. Just Mm -hmm. like when we take the time to get into the pleasure, like we've talked about on the previous episodes, when you take the time to get into the senses and you appreciate, you have that gratitude, it's always mixing in a little bit of each of these archetypes. Of course, they're all connected, beginning and ending. The cycle started, it finished. Now, where can we go from here? That feeling of fear of going into stillness can feel like jumping off a diving board. I like to let myself think what would happen if and be open to the beauty and excitement of what could I get out of this? I think about this, how I've been working with my outer winters lately. I love 
doing my workouts and being super physically active all the time. So in the winter, I've been trying to notice what does my body want? Being able to give into what it feels like it really wants without fear of, oh no, I'm going to lose all my progress. I'm going to become weak and lazy. Well, what would happen if I did let myself rest? And just be open to the fact that maybe I'm going to have more energy when the spring comes. <laughs> I also work with this in my menstrual cycle too. I used to be an athlete in high school and it was difficult workouts all day, every day. I did for sure lose my cycle. For me, my physical works are a great, great barometer of what's going on in my body. Sometimes I'll go into a workout thinking it's going to be one thing and that energy is just not there. So I just let it go because I know that if I do, I'm going to have the energy for the next cycle. That's a huge piece that I actually haven't touched on quite yet is the rest and restoration in the menstrual phase and the winter phase. That rest is really important in order to have energy for later on. I heard somebody on a podcast recently who said that they will notice that if they work out too hard in their fall, winter, that it really saps their energy for the next cycle. So the cycle after that, I was like, okay, I'm going to try a little harder to slow down. And it really helps to have more energy in your entire cycle. If you honor that resting, you're not burning yourself all the way down to the ground. I have some girlfriends who will have gone completely bed ridden the first three days, at least give or take how they feel. Of course, they're surrendering to this Mm -hmm. close to the veil wise ancestral plane that they enter into. And they have only skyrocketed in what they're creating. I mean, it's Mm -hmm. tenfold. They have a beautiful retreat coming up in Greece and Mm -hmm. This happened last year, but now two of them have come together and they're creating this magic and it's just blown up. Both of them are very dedicated to their menstrual cycle and the ritual that they hold during this time. I'd love to hear if you have any rituals that you like to perform or have around this era besides resting and slowing down. I don't have specific rituals for me. That is definitely something that I would like to work in eventually, but because my brain goes so fast and because I like to be active so much, that is one of my challenges. This is definitely a teacher for me. And I don't want to make anyone think that you need an elaborate ritual. Elaborate rituals are fun and exciting, but the way I've dealt with this myself is to grab onto the moments of stillness and just lie on the ground. Mm -hmm. That's my ritual. If I'm feeling that I'm hitting a wall to honor that and go lie on the ground. I don't know if everybody loves lying on the ground as much as I do, but I think it's amazing, (laughs) especially outside or next to the fire, depending on the season. My ritual is honoring that it doesn't need to be perfect. (laughs) Mm. It's beautiful and it's perfect for you. That's why I love Mm -hmm. you emphasizing, make it what you need. If you know that you're a recovering perfectionist, Mm -hmm. go. You are looking to add more structure into your life, curate a ritual that feels good in your body to deepen your intuitive nature with yourself. Mm -hmm. Is there anything you'd like to add? There's the shadows that we haven't talked about yet. We can see the shadows of the wise woman crone in our culture specifically because we don't honor the wise woman crone because our culture values a lot more of the virgin warrior mother archetypes. That's one thing to watch out for with this mother crone energy is that sometimes she can have maybe feelings of jealousy or bitterness or of ego pride or anything where she's feeling not valued. An example for our workplace, this is someone who's not in the wise woman crone time of her life. But if you think about a job for like 10 years and you have a lot of wisdom and experience, and then someone who's new and young comes in, they have all these new fresh ideas and they don't really care about your ideas. You can imagine how that person might feel. Maybe some jealousy, feeling cast aside, discarded. That's one of the shadows that can come up is knowing and feeling your worth, even in the face of new things. Because you know that you have part of the cycle, because there's always going to be some wisdom in that. Even if somebody comes in new and they have great ideas, you still have ideas that are valuable. They're going to look different when you combine them with these new ideas, but you still have a piece of the whole for the wise woman crone. Being able to hold that truth just because there's something new doesn't mean that I'm 
outdated or old, that oldness is a wisdom that is valuable and needed for ourselves, for our culture, being able to sit in that. That's really important. I I notice that when I get to the menstrual phase of my cycle, I sometimes feel very old. (laughs) And this is something that I didn't mention, which I think is a really important piece, is that every month with our cycles to experience death. This is really special. And I feel so honored that I get this experience of being able to get close to death every cycle. It helps prepare me for that time of life that's that's going to be scary, right? When we get close to death, sometimes I have this feeling of, oh my gosh, I will look in the mirror sometimes and kind of preparing myself for that feeling that will maybe come up. Like when I get to to be a, an elderly woman looking in the mirror and being like, wow, where did all that time go? I'm not young like I used to be. Being able to sit in that discomfort and know that I'm still me. I'm still valuable just because I look different doesn't mean anything. We've made it to mean something, but it doesn't necessarily mean anything. Those two things of being able to to recognize that shadow and to let it sit and to know that, wow, this cycle is, I'm experiencing death, you know, once a month, <laughs> every year. And, and this is really special and amazing. <laughs> that is 12 times a year. We get to practice. Yeah. (laughs) That is pretty profound. I come to this thought in my head of so many people in the world, no one specific of all ages, are going to these different technologies or treatments to become younger looking or to freeze themselves Mm -hmm. where they are so that they don't get older. In my body, this feels like such a, uh, like, why? Why are you doing this? You're so beautiful. You're so gorgeous how you are. And you're only going to age and become more beautiful and more gorgeous. That's going to naturally happen. What is this wanting to freeze and stay the same and to keep ourselves in this box? Do you have any thoughts around that? We can all look at the media. I mean, basically, this is what people are telling us that we need to be and do. I think it's a reclamation of the full cycle hear a lot about our culture being very linear. It makes me think about how if you take a circle and you draw a line across the side of it, you get this line that's a tangent to the circle. I think of us not being able to go in a circle sometimes. I think about us being like, I'm I'm coming around the side of the circle that's going to be the virgin warrior. And then the straight line just happens and I fly off the circle, right? And this would be way better if I could draw it or something for you. So I hope if you're listening, you can hear this. But if you think about tracing a circle and you're coming around, everything's going great. You're following the curve. And then all of a sudden you hit that virgin warrior. And then it's just like this straight, straight line. It's just like, I'm going to be the virgin warrior forever. That's not, that's not how cycles work. Being able to honor the whole circle is really important. And that's why I do this work really is honoring the whole cycle. That's why I talk about the seasons and the moon cycle and these life cycles and our menstrual cycles is that our lives are cyclical in so many ways. And I think we've gotten into this linear culture of, I want it to be one way. And that's just not how things are. (laughs) Mm, mm, mm. And it is these conversations and the hundreds of thousands of conversations similar to this that are happening nowadays. Whereas five years ago, I had no idea. I had no idea any of this was going on. And what was I five years ago? 21. I was Mm -hmm. so unaware of my cycle, of my body Mm -hmm. and the high school, like you'd mentioned earlier, losing your cycle from sports. Didn't, who was she? didn't have one for years. How devastating that is on our body. It's sad. And I think that we are really helping nurture the actual virgin goddesses Mm -hmm. that are upcoming and have all this access to technology and want to use this for good. I want to honor the cyclical nature of myself. How can I remain sustainable so that I don't Mm -hmm burnout and become another single use plastic item in the world. <laughs> right. Yeah. But we have to take on our whole selves and honor all parts of it. And that's why I love the archetype work, really recognizing, noticing, nurturing, pulling in, showing off, growing all these parts of ourselves and not denying any of them. And it's really fun. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah. so much it's fun. Simple. It's yeah. like playing dress up. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. And like I said, 
if you have not ever moon journaled before, I highly recommend it. And you should go yeah. grab that guide because it really can change your life. I know it's changed mine and all my friends that have done it in some way. Since our yeah. first conversation, I've started doing it. And just the couple, yeah. jot, jot, jots. It's amazing. I cannot wait for my next cycle to yes. happen. I'm so excited. Yeah. <laughs> I know this is our last episode. You have to keep letting me know. Update me a little bit because I love hearing it. I definitely will. Would you like to summarize all four? Would you like to do bring anything else into the conversation before we close? Yeah. If this is the first one that you're listening to, go back and listen to them. But just a quick recap, there's four phases of our cycle and four distinct phases, but of course they're very fluid. So they're not boxes. The first phase of our cycle is the follicular phase. Well, some people would call it first phase, the menstrual phase, because that would be day one technically. But like I said, it's a circle. So you could start anywhere and end in there. I always think about the first phase as the follicular phase, who is or which is corresponding with spring energy, both internally and externally, and also with the virgin warrior type. And then we have the summer, which is ovulation for us, but also mother creator energy. And the full moon, virgin warrior would be waxing moon. And then the the mother creator is the full moon, abundance, fullness. Then we have the waning time of our cycles. That could be waning moon. That could be premenstrual. That's fall. And that's the wild woman enchantress who's very misunderstood, but also very important for us. And then the one we just talked about. So wise woman crone, which is our inner winter, can also feel her energy in the outer winter or in that older time of our lives. Also associated with the new moon, the dark moon. Mm. I just love the moon. I love all these energies. I've loved these conversations so much. They're such a, it's just been heartwarming and so fulfilling. Yeah, me too. I have so appreciated (laughs) these. It's been great to talk to you. Well, I cannot highly recommend enough to go listen to all four parts of this, whether you are male or female, or you don't identify with either. Go and listen because we're all cyclical nature, some more than others. We're all here we're in this new era if i want to bring some astrology into it for the next 18 months we're on a new nodal axis with the moon so the moon has shifted in that way Mm -hmm. we were in this fixed energy where it was taurus scorpio and our north node was in taurus our south node was in scorpio so we're moving towards being more thrifty more reliable on ourselves a little more wise with money with family matters with with the practical way of being, then how can we take educated risks? How can we be a little bit more transparent and honest? And now it's all shifting into Libra and Aries. And we're coming into this, how can I be independent while cultivating a community that is supportive, that is loving, that is endearing, and wants balance, wants justice, wants to have a very sustainable love, which is very much having everybody have a spot at the table. Like everyone gets to sit at the same table, not just one type of people. No one's excluded. Even if you're male and you're like, none of this really applies to me. It does because you came from a mother. You came from someone who had a vagina to support the other females or those with a cycle in your life is so beautiful. If you look back to ancient times in tribes, those who were menstruating were hailed to because they had the wisdom that you're speaking of. They were the ones that these tribe people could go to and ask questions and receive answers. You did not bother these women and they were just highly respected. It's a big coming together full circle and honoring one another. Like just because if you're a male and you don't have this cycle, well, you can honor your 24 hour cycle. Women can also appreciate that in a male as well. It's just full circle. I love that this has been a wholesome through and through conversation where every way you look at it, they intertwine. They really do. I love it. So thank you everybody for being here. Thank you so much, Brie, for granting us with a freaking masterclass (laughs) workshop series. You're amazing. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. I really appreciate you having me on. It's been so fun. Gosh. All right. Well, everybody, This is it. This is the end. Go back, listen, send them to your friends, share them on your socials, and make sure that you sign up for that freebie moon journaling 
if you have any ounce of menstrual cycle in your body, (laughs) it will help you. It will awaken you to how you can just more naturally fall into line with who you are. Mm-hmm. And so, if you don't have a menstrual cycle, you can do it on the lunar cycle. And I do explain that in the guide too. So, Yes, yes. If you are past that era in your life, the moon is still your friend. Listen to p- part one of the series for more information on that. All right. Well, thank you so much, Bree. Thank you so much, everyone, for listening. And we'll talk to you next time.